Hello, I'm Angela Dillard, professor in the Departments of Afro-American and African Study, History, and the Residential College here at the University of Michigan. And I'm joined today with Justin Wolfers, uh, professor of economics and at the Ford School of Public Policy. Today, we're talking about prediction markets. We tend to be much more familiar with polling and polling data. Polls are run by news organizations and universities and private entities, campaigns. There's snap polls after presidential debates, individual polls done by campaigns to gauge voter opinion. And there are websites um, that present us with aggregate data on hundreds of polls being done right now. But many of us are far less familiar with prediction markets, which arguably give us the same kind of information, but in a different way. Justin, can you fill us in on prediction markets? Give us a little bit of the, the basic backgrounds about what they are and how they operate. Yeah, so here's the, the simple part of it. Um, it's like a financial market um, where there's a stock that might be worth a dollar if, well, not might, that is worth a dollar if Joe Biden's the next president. And people can buy and sell that stock. Now, think about it. If I thought Joe Biden was a 75% chance to be president and the stock was 70 cents, I'd think that was a really good buy, so I'd go and buy the stock. And if you thought that he was less than a 70% chance to win, then you would think it was a good deal to sell the stock. And so our buying and selling will reflect our beliefs about the, yours and my beliefs about the probability that Biden wins the election. So I looked actually uh, last night and Biden was a 69, you could buy a stock that pays a dollar if Biden becomes president for 69 cents. So the one way to interpret that is it's as if the market is telling you the market believes there's a 69% chance of Biden being president. Now you might say, why do I care about the market? Um, markets get a lot of things wrong. Another answer is markets get a lot of things right. One thing that markets do is aggregate information. And the way this market works is I might have just seen a poll where Biden did really well. So I'll start buying stock. On the way home last night, Angela, maybe you saw a lot of Trump yard signs. So you think, well, there's a lot of support for Trump in Michigan. So then you'd sell the stock. It could be that I watched the vice presidential de uh, debate and I saw that Kamala Harris did well. So then I'd buy the stock. Um, and different people each see different pieces of information and they'll trade based on that information. And so that price will come to reflect your view and my view and the view of, the of someone who's just read the polls. And I have a friend who runs statistical models based on the state of the economy and he bets in this market as well. And the price will reflect that as well. And it will reflect hard data, what's going on in the polls, what's going on in the economy, soft data, what people's perceptions were about who won each of the debates. Um, and so the logic is that if the price comes to reflect all of this information, it aggregates the wisdom of crowds and the market is typically wiser than any one of us. Um, that's the logic at least. So I tend to think of these as fairly recent developments, but I understand now that that's not the case. It's the, 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 there's a longer history here. Could you talk a little bit about that? It's really interesting. So I've been talking about these markets for about a decade or two. And through that time period, Americans have become a lot more um, aware of these markets and they've become a bigger part of our press discussions about the narrative of campaigns. But I have a colleague, actually, Paul Rode in the economics department, a wonderful economic historian, who went back through the archives and it turns out that these prediction markets were in fact the primary way that we tracked elections through the latter part of the 19th century and the first half of the 20th century. So if it was the day before or three weeks before the 1896 election and you opened, looked at the front page of the New York Times, you wouldn't have seen any polling results. Now that's because polling hadn't been invented yet. But what there was was a prediction market. And I should be a bit careful about describing this. It was literally on the curb at Wall Street. So if you think about Wall Street, it's where the financial titans go to trade. And what do financial titans like to do once the market's closed and they can no longer trade? Well, they like to go outside and trade instead. And so what they would do is literally on their lunch hour or after work, they'd go outside and they would buy and sell stock in whoever was running for president in exactly the way I described before. And so we have data on American political prediction markets for over a hundred years. And the, they've turned out to be remarkably accurate. I think it's fair to say, there's a debate about this. I'm on one side of this debate. They've turned out to be more accurate than polls. They've turned out to be more accurate than mathematical 
formulae that relate the state of the economy to who's going to win. They've turned out to be more accurate than polling aggregators like Nate Silver. Uh, they've turned out to be more accurate than talking heads on CNN. Um, so the claim that these work is something of an empirical claim, not just an economist telling you that they have faith in markets. So in a kind of debate over markets versus polls, are there things about the prediction markets that maybe would draw to its weaknesses as something that can be really used as a generative tool to predict outcomes of elections and those sorts of things? Right. Good question. So um, I don't like to talk about markets versus polls. I'd say markets and polls. In fact, one of the most important things that shapes where markets go is polls. Um, and so maybe actually the wisdom of the market is it gets to see all the polls, people who trade in the market get to see the poll, polls and they get to see other information, right? But they're not always gonna be perfect at that. And so there are a few well-known uh, problems that researchers reveal. So one is there's something called the favorite long shot bias. Psychologists tell us this. It turns out people aren't very good at telling the difference between a small probability and a tiny probability. And so if people aren't very good at that, when they trade on that, they're not very good at that. And so that means we find it hard to distinguish between, you know, a one in a thousand, one in a hundred, uh, maybe three in a hundred. And so it turns out that people tend to overbet on very unlikely things. So if the market tells you something's a 5% chance of happening, Truth is, it's probably much less. In fact, I looked at the market the other day, it said that Hillary Clinton was a 2% chance to win the 2020 election. Mm -hmm. I'm willing to admit it's not zero, but I really doubt it's 2%. It might be 0.2% or 0.02%. Um, so when the, the further the probabilities get away from you know, the broad range of 20 to 80, the more likely they are to be biased. The second is some of these markets are quite thin. That's economists speak for, there's not a lot of people trading in them. So when you are aggregating information from a small number of people, that's gonna be less accurate than when you're aggregating it from a large number of people. So when we had markets on the curve at Wall Street, they're actually very, very big markets. A lot of the markets right now, you're only allowed to only exist for research purposes because some of this is seen as gambling and so sometimes comes under anti-gambling laws. Um, so you can only bet hundreds of dollars, whereas when people bet on the stock market, they're trading millions and sometimes billions of dollars. And then the final thing to be wary of is, for instance, there are prediction markets. By the way, prediction markets is the polite term that I use because I'm an academic, but it's betting. It's plain and simple. It's betting on the election. And so we can learn a lot about prediction markets from looking at betting markets. And it turns out that when you go and ask, look at the, the odds among British bookmakers for whether Britain will win the Soccer World Cup, they always say it's really likely. Now, the thing about the British soccer team is they always find a way to lose. Um, so what's happening there is the people who are trading in that market are all Brits and they're all incredibly loyal and they're all betting money. So that changes the odds. There's some suggestion that may be a problem in political prediction markets, which is people who trade in these tend to be um, upper middle class white men, a lot like the financial sector, frankly. They're overly Republican. Now, the thing to realize is a poll asks you who you plan to vote for and who you hope will win. When you bet in a market, you want to bet instead on who you think will win. And so you don't want to be like one of these British soccer fans just always betting on a loser. You want to take a step back and think about what's going to happen. And so it turns out that these markets have actually been quite accurate, even though the traders are actually quite unrepresentative. And that's because we're asking the traders a different question. We're asking them, who do you think will win? and we're forcing them to put their money where their mouth is, and that leads some of those biases to go away. Well, Justin, you, re you recently visited my class, Democracy and Debate across LSA, and we had this conversation with them about polls and markets as predictive tools for things like elections, especially the upcoming 2020 presidential election. And then after the class, I asked my students to pick one in terms of their faith in its predictive capacities or it sounds like ease. a poll angela it does you their should have asked them to bet was, on which I one did. would be I right should have asked them to bet you're absolutely right um so i did kind of stack it a little bit towards polls you're right but would it surprise you to know that in a well well over two to one margin they picked markets uh, even when they thought about the fact that that this is less representative you know, in terms of class and background, 
the, the kinds of people who participate in markets, but they still thought at the end of the day that that's going to use a better that that's going to yield a better outcome. Is that surprising to you? Well, if I want to be true to myself, I shouldn't believe or put too much stock in the result of your poll. You were just asking people what they thought. We should see what happens. Do they bet? Uh, you know, when they're making hard decisions, are they going to be more likely to look at the markets than the polls? Um, look, one useful thing about markets is there are actually once you understand the idea, and that takes a little bit. They're actually pretty simple. And so on any given day of the week, you can say, I want to know what's happening in politics. One view is I have to sit down and read through 12 polls. Another view is I just look up this one website and look at one number, 69, 69% chance that Biden's going to win. And then I've aggregated, it's as if I've read all the information that everyone in the market has already read. Um, and so, you know, maybe simplicity is a useful virtue. Now, it's, I'm a little bit surprised in one respect. Um, first of all, right now in the middle of a deep recession is not exactly the best time to be arguing that markets are efficient our students see evidence all around them that markets can be really dysfunctional um and you know ls and a students tend to be somewhat more suspicious of markets my guess is your class had it certainly had some political science and economic students i recognize some of my students in there but people who haven't been trained to think about markets the way economists have are often innately suspicious of them um, you know, the one common rejoinder is, you know, if markets are so good, why did we have the 2008 recession? And the answer is that's a really good critique. Um, but polls have problems too. And so I think the best reframing of that is all of these are faulty tools. And the question is, what's the least bad way of predicting the election? And so I'm willing to admit to lots of flaws in markets, but I think there might be fewer flaws than the alternatives. I think that's right. I also think that your presence and the arguments that you made and the way that you explained it also helped to tilt the balance towards markets. <laughs> but thank you, thank you so much, coming. Justin, for thank walking you. us through a few aspects of this fascinating topic. Today's conversation will join others as part of the Democracy and Debate Collection, which is a joint project between the Center for Academic Innovation and the Fall 2020 Democracy and Debate theme semester. For all of you listening who want to know a little bit more, I can recommend the site Predicted as a really good place to start. Thank you again. Thanks, Angela.